morning, everybody. My name is John Ruder. I'm Dudley's Town Administrator. And tonight, at the request of the Board of Selectmen, I will be facilitating a community outreach meeting for adult use marijuana hosted by the applicant, DMA Holdings, for their proposed facility at 35 and 37 Chase Ave. Before we start, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Before we start, um, I want everybody to notice that the rostrum behind me, the applicant is empty. That means that there's no board of committee meeting tonight. This is a uh, meeting entirely hosted by um, the applicant. There's not going to be any voting tonight, no deliberation tonight. And um, we'll proceed accordingly. Tonight, I believe that DMA's schedule is they're going to make a PowerPoint presentation and provide some answers to some commonly asked questions. And then at the end, we'll have the opportunity to hear questions from the audience. So without further ado. Thank you, Mr. Town Administrator. My name is Nick Adamopoulos. I'm from Lakeshore Legal in Webster, and I'm acting as local counsel for this project. Um, to my right is Joe Velotico. He's a co-founder of DMA Holdings. Um, he's also a childhood resident of the local area. And to my left is Bobby Nichols, who will be able to answer most of the operational questions that may get raised later on. Um, as the town administrator stated, we're going to go through about 12 to 13 slides, um, kind of explaining the proposed project, and at the end, um, we'll open up to any questions and comments that anyone in the audience has. Can everybody hear okay? So the project um, is proposed for 35 and 37 Chase Ave. Um, this is the old 1864 mill building, um, and this project will maintain the historical integrity of that building. Um, and we find it very important to make sure that the historical look and feel of that building is maintained. So any build out will occur inside the existing structure. Um, you know, also we had some questions raised um, before the meeting. By the time that a final licensure is granted for this project, um, any current businesses inside that property right now <coughs> will cease. Um, and we are looking for three licenses. It would be for adult use cultivation of 100,000 square feet canopy. Um, it would also be adult use manufacturing of products themselves. And it would be adult use retail um, on a building that's already existing of about 5,000 square feet. And the primary focus of this business is the cultivation and product manufacturing. Um, the retail will be there, but the expertise and the knowledge that's getting brought is for the manufacturing cultivation. I know there was some comments that the retail was going to really be the driving force um, and that the entire mill may be utilized as a retail location and that's not what this proposal is and the proposal that would be getting made to the town and the state will show that it's only for that 5,000 square foot brick building right um, in the lower left hand corner. So just a brief uh, overview of the licensure process itself. Um, we first met with the selectmen, and that happened on August 26th. Then, per the regulations from the state, we are to hold this community outreach meeting um, where we uh, leave the floor open at the end for any questions. Um, following this meeting, we would then schedule another meeting to sit down with the selectmen and request permission to negotiate a host agreement with the town. Um, if the selectmen do allow that, we would talk to town council and negotiate the host agreement and the particulars of the host agreement will get discussed uh, in a few minutes. We would then submit a complete application um, to the Cannabis Control Commission. That's three separate packets, um, including background checks on all the investors, um, operations, and um, special packets for the retail manufacturing and cultivation. Once those packets are received by the Cannabis uh, Control Commission, we will also meet with the um, planning board to get a special permit where we would present our build-out plans, um, the security plans, and everything along those lines. Um, we would then receive a provisional license from the Canvas Commission if they accept our 
proposal. And at that point, we can seek uh, to start the build out of both the retail and the mill itself. Um, all build out plans have to first go in front of the state for them to be approved. And ultimately, when they come to do the final licensure approval, the Canvas Commission does a walkthrough and will make sure that those build out plans were followed. So we can't present anything to the state and then make material changes later on because a final license would not be granted. Um, upon receiving a final license, we would then be able to open. Um, there's a lot of local aspects to this project. Um, two of the co-founders are Joe Velotico and Malcolm Beers. Um, they're childhood area residents um, of Webster and Dudley. Um, they're very committed to community development aspects of this and um, really the fact that this building was properly zoned and that they could bring their expertise and the amount of jobs to the local area is one of the driving points behind them seeking um, these three licenses in Dudley. Um, there's a lot of job creation that will also occur from this project. Um, the estimate based upon current um, aspects in the western states where these two entities are located is that this could bring about 400 jobs. That's based upon two full-time um, staffs of 150 jobs in the cultivation and processing side and then there'd be about 100 additional jobs that would be in the retail side and at nighttime there's a reduced shift in the cultivation and manufacturing side. So at the end of the day we're looking at somewhere between three to four hundred jobs created from this project and as part of the host agreement we would give any Dudley job applicant that satisfies the requirement of a job preference to a job opening over a non-Dudley resident. Um, there's also the host agreement payments that the town would receive. Um, these will be negotiated but Ultimately, these are meaningful payments to the town, and the town and the Board of Selectmen and Finance Committees would ultimately be able to decide how those funds would be utilized. Um, the regulations in the state do mandate the cap on how much can be um, given each year, but all these host agreements are for five-year periods, and they all include a new provision that would say that if DMA Holdings were to ever open up another location in another town, and that town were to receive better uh, terms, Dudley would then get those better terms immediately. So there's no way for Dudley to kind of get a short end of any stick if this were to expand into another town. Um, on the retail side, the state uh, allows for a 3% local sales tax on every product that is sold, and that 3% local sales tax was accepted at a Dudley town meeting previously. Uh, and there's also community outreach that occurs from charitable donations to local charities that we would uh, work with the town um, and these charities to determine how to best allocate funds. Um, there'd be community service hours that would be mandated by employees. And uh, one of the items that we've already decided to do is make sure that at least two or three Dudley police officers get DRE training, which uh, is special training that makes them a drug recognition expert that would make them experts uh, in the court system for um, analyzing whether an individual was under the effects of any intoxicating drugs from marijuana to any other narcotic. Um, as I said, there's, there's a lot of experience that is being brought with this project. Um, the founders have experience in both cannabis and hemp. Um, they founded and operated a major hemp operation in Colorado. Um, there's 1,700 acres of hemp and there's a large processing facility also owned by that company. Um, the operational partner um, is coming, uh, is one of the leading marijuana suppliers in Washington State. They currently have a 140,000 square foot cultivation and processing operation ongoing. So that would once again correlate to the size of this project. Um, all the required financing is in place. Um, you know, we'd have to show all the capitalization to the state. So we've, we do have that. And because these uh, companies are already bringing in their experience, the policies and procedures are in place, compliance standards to make sure that the regulations will be met are already in place, and they're going to bring in a high quality product to Dudley and to Massachusetts. Now to go over some common concerns that normally get raised. Um, the biggest is normally traffic. Um, the host agreement will likely mandate a period of appointment only um, concerning the retail operation. Um, it's usually around a six month period. and 
Um, this will allow both the company and the town to gauge traffic flow and um, customer flow. Um, also, just for example, Worcester uh, recently, maybe two months ago, opened up their first retail establishment. They implemented an appointment only, and within the first month, the chief of police from Worcester actually went and asked that that restriction be removed because there was no uptick in traffic. But this at least gives some protection to the town and to the company to make sure that they work to analyze any traffic flow patterns. Um, this project also has an advantage that there's adequate parking. The brick building where the retail will be located already has 20 spots dedicated to that spot. Um, the big parking lot that is in front of the current bar has between 150 to 200 spots currently. And we would run a walkway from that big parking lot to the retail operations so that any foot traffic would be able to go across the lawn rather than being diverted towards the street. Um, but the 20 parking spots in front of the retail is already more than most of these retail establishments have. So that's a good protection for both controlling the flow of traffic and we already have an additional 200 spots and there's plenty of area to potentially expand parking if necessary. Further, we'd work with both the town, highway department, and police departments to make sure that there are safety measures in place, um, whether that's installing stop signs or other signage, um, you know, making sure that there's a police detail when the f establishment first opens up if the town mandates that. Um, there was some talk of the curve, um, I believe that's Scof on Chase Ave, um, whether that includes putting in a small um, sidewalk or Jersey barriers, that would be something that DMA Holdings, the police department, highway department, town officials would all discuss while um, seeking a special permit from the planning board. But we will make sure that any way that we can help to make sure that the town's happy with the traffic flow and that everything's protected will get done. Um, further, the hours um, concerning this operation will be much different than the bar. Um, most of these establishments have their hours from about 10 to about 7. Um, so that late night traffic that maybe local residents see coming from the bar at night would no longer be there. Further, that big parking lot, most of it's going to be used by employees. So the traffic pattern may be more similar to when Ethan Allen was there than um, you know, retail flow. So you'd have employees who are responsible to their employer coming out of that parking lot rather than really the retail traffic because that's more going to be mandated towards that 20 spot radius. And this isn't going to be Lester. I know everyone thinks and saw what happened with Lester on TV. Um, Lester was a good guinea pig. Um, everyone learned from it. That's why the appointment only went in place. Um, further, the news really doesn't uh, publicize these openings any longer. And these are becoming more and more common from town to town. So <coughs> the uh, spectacle of them has kind of worn away and you're not having people from all over the state kind of migrate to one area. Um, really the most comparison I could say is Oxbridge, who is actually going to town meeting this fall. Uh, and I believe the selectmen are gonna ask that the cap of two stores be taken off so they could open up more because they've seen really no traffic issues with the establishments they currently have in place. Um, one of the other issues that we got some phone calls about um, concerned having both the bar and the retail establishment on the same property. Um, upon receiving a provisional license and prior to any final license being received, the current bar would be closing. Um, further, DMA holding is comprised of an entirely different set of owners than the current property owners. And as I stated, the operational hours would be much different than you know, the current bar hours. So you wouldn't have late night traffic going to 12 or 1 o'clock at night. It's more so probably between 10 to 7. And that would be something that gets negotiated um, through the host agreement with the town. Um, the other common concern is smell. So as I stated earlier, the build out occurs inside the existing structure. You're really building rooms within rooms. Um, further, you know, with their experience, they've already learned that using a chlorine uh, dioxide system and putting carbon scrubbers on uh, plenum exhaust units is the best way of uh, remediating any sort of smell from going out of the property. 
Um, you know, we brought this up with the selectmen, but there's a current, I believe, 55,000 square foot grow in Webster. Um, it's been there for, I think, five, six years at this point. And I would expect that most people probably don't even realize it's there. So, um, you know, I don't think there's much smell concerns, but everything that can be done to remediate that would be put in place. And they're bringing in the equipment they've already utilized out west to make sure that they can reduce any sort of smell. Um, other areas are environmental. So the um, average water usage is about 0.22 gallons per square foot of cultivation. So in our estimate, that's about 20,000 gallons per day. Um, but there is wastewater remediation done on site and everything is 100% recycled and reused. So there's zero waste <coughs> or runoff um, that occurs from this project. But the daily usage is about 20,000 gallons. It's all utilized and it's all recycled. Um, so there's really no runoff from that. Further, this project would, you know, utilize between seven to 10,000 amps of electricity. We've already spoken to National Grid. The electricity is available uh, on the property and across the street. And any upgrade to any electrical system um, would be occurred on the property itself. So it wouldn't affect any of the uh, local residents. And that would be done by DMA themselves. Um, any sort of environmental waste, it would be organic waste only. Um, so everything that's done in there is fully biodegradable. There's no pesticides used. Um, the regulations do not allow for pesticide to be used. Um, and DMA uses a full organic practice that they would be um, bringing in from their expertise. And there's really no meaningful noise that would get generated from this project that would affect um, anyone in the you know, neighboring area. Um, the other thing is obviously Dudley uh, does abut um, Connecticut and it's pretty close to Rhode Island. So signage would be posted about the federal and state consequences if you were to transport this product across state lines. Um, you have to show an ID when you get in the building, when you purchase a product. So uh, consumers who are not Massachusetts residents would receive a handout that would inform them of the consequences of taking that product and driving it back into a neighboring state. Um, you know, the duty of DMA would be to educate these individuals of these consequences and to make sure that everyone is aware that the use and purchasability is allowed in Massachusetts, but it may not be allowed in neighboring states. And then the Cannabis Commission is the um, entity that regulates this. It is heavily regulated. Um, the regulations continue to evolve on nearly a month-to-month -month basis. They just did a full um, overhaul of the regulations um, right before the holiday. Um, there's also yearly compliance checks that you have to meet where um, the Canvas Commission will check to make sure that, you know, you're still meeting those regulations, your security is in place. Um, security is heavily regulated, um, both building security where there's cameras and alarms and intercom systems. Um, background checks. Um, I did speak to the police chief earlier. There will be uh, lighting put in place so that um, individuals at nighttime would still be able to get identified by those cameras. Um, and advertising is also uh, regulated. Um, signage is very limited. You can't, you know, this is not going to be a liquor store or a bar. You can't put, um, you know, neon signs outside. Really all you can put outside the retail establishment is the name of the business. Um, advertising is uh, limited to where you can do that. And really, um, I think if you drive by most of these institutions, you know, for example, Cureleaf is on Main Street in Oxford. If you didn't know it was there, you'd probably drive right by and not realize that there's a retail shop there because the regulations are in place not to draw attention to these establishments. Um, and their operations are very regulated from how to grow, how to manufacture, what you can grow, what you can manufacture, how you can sell things, the warnings on the labels, um, your logos. Everything is, is well regulated, regulated by the state. They're very cognizant to make sure that those regulations are being followed, um, which makes the product safe for um, the end user. And ultimately, um, we're going to open up the floor to any questions. Um, Joe and Bobby will probably be able to answer most of those, but if you guys need any other information or have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. 
Um, I'll pass those questions along and I will get you answers. Mr. Adamopoulos, could you share that PowerPoint with me and we'll post it on the website as well so it'll be available? I will certainly do that. Okay, great. Okay, let's, look, how about if we reintroduce ourselves on the table here and, and, and state what everybody's stake is in the project? Bobby Nichols, um, I'm on the side of the cultivation side, the grow, the facility, the, uh, the build out, um, and anything to do with the plant. Um, that's our side of the, of the business. Um, so I'm able to answer any questions you may have or concerns on, on any level, whether it be construction, whether it be the plant itself, whether it be how we grow, uh, things we do and things we don't do. Uh, my name is Joe Velotico. I'm actually from Webster, Massachusetts. Um, I am a part of DMA Holdings, founder of DMA Holdings. Um, we are the management investment company behind the project. Uh, I have been involved in the cannabis for quite some time now and also in the hemp side of things as well. Um, currently operate a company that <clears throat> employs over 300 people in Colorado and uh, we're very familiar with uh, these size projects and we're very happy and thank you guys for coming tonight. Great. Thank you. Who would like the first question? Wow. Mr. Siganevich. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> so as we go up to the mic and ask the question, could you just simply identify yourself and state whether you are a resident or non-resident, please? Jason Johnson, uh, Jonathan Pass. I am a resident. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, waste stream coming out of the building? Uh, it said biodegradable, but uh, what kind of waste stream and how is that uh, the security on that? Good question. So um, there is, we have no we have no liquid waste um, from from the water perspective is what it said in the in the PowerPoint. Um, any and all water that's used gets reused. We have there's no there's no uh, liquid waste that en that leaves the building. As far as any of the biodegradable stuff and the, on, from the plant perspective itself, um, we actually reuse everything. So uh, the stuff that's even from in the bud form, this people would see the marijuana in, uh, whether it be the the stalks, the stems, and the leaves, all get gathered. And through that gathering process, we make what's called distillate or and or oils for this, whether it be for candies, edibles, or now I know vape has issues now in the lat it's on, on a hold here for the next four months, which I'd be happy to uh, have any questions on that as well. But um, we strip everything from the plant, so the plant actually looks like it does, but what happens through this distillation process, it takes all the THCs and all the terpenes from the actual marijuana plant, and it becomes basically like grass that you would have in your lawn. And we, we have a company that comes and takes that or they incinerate it. I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna work here, but I can assure you that all of that green waste is dealt with through uh, being fully biodegradable, whatever is the, the rules and regs here. We're under such strict regulations in California and in, Washi in the state of Washington. I'm assuming it's probably on par with, with those states and, and we've been doing this for five and a half years there. So whatever the, whatever the warrants are that we need to abide by here in this, in this town, we, we will abide by. Uh, one more question, uh, 20,000 gallons a day Yes. But you reuse all the water. 100%. So is it 20,000 uh, 20, gallons one time and you reuse it, or is it going 20,000 going into the plant? No, 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 the no plant. there's definitely evaporation. No, no, we, we use it in the plant. We just, there's no spill through. So we don't like use 20,000 when we actually can use 10. It's, it's a number that we, ha we have derived through, through the, our processes. Um, that that's about what it comes out to per square foot. It's a, it, that, that per square foot basis is something that we've been doing for the last four to five years. So we, we have it down to pretty much right spot on. Um, and I can't say that we use 20,000 per day. It depends on humidity and other factors, but to be safe, we, we erred on the higher side of that to make sure that uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're accurate in what our, what our projections are on the grid. Thank you. Who would like the next question? Yes, yeah, Mr. Kunkel. Good evening. Thank you, gentlemen, for an excellent business presentation. 
Thank you. Uh, my question right now is, I know this isn't the first time you've appeared uh, before the peoples in Dudley and so forth. Have there been any endorsements, A, from the Boards of Selectmen, uh, the Finance Board, Capital Improvement Committee? Uh, and if so, I'd like to hear them. I've been in the, uh, just retired from the school business, as a school business manager in Webster for over 22 years. I'm always concerned about how this is going to affect our community and especially our children. Along with being a retired business manager, I'm also a grandfather, which I am very proud of, of four lovely children. I just am concerned about is this the right fit for Dudley? It sounds like an outstanding business proposal, and I can see it. You've put a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of research in it. But I'm at a, I'm at a crossroads here, whether I'm endorsing or not. I'm worried about our fine community, great service, policemen, highway, fire department, and so forth, outstanding school department. Is this going to affect any one of those entities? And if there is, I'd like to find out about it. If you've got any experience in that area, please tell me. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, I'm born and raised here in Webster, Massachusetts. I grew up here. Um, to have the opportunity to actually bring back to a community that gave me what I'm fortunate to have today, right? Um, one of the main things is, to answer your question, is they're all going to benefit from that. Um, the police departments, the fire departments, the town. Um, you know, there's a lot of businesses here in town, uh, and we actually have the opportunity to give back. Um, and that's one of the main things. Um, you know, 3% of what we do in revenue is a very large number that's going to be given back to the town. Um, all of the stuff that we will be doing, uh, number one, we're going to take a building that is, uh, is going to be 100% taken up to all codes uh, that right now isn't currently. Um, so I think that the town is going to benefit from that as well. Um, and one of the things that I do want to answer is, you know, when I first got into this business was a worry too. I love kids. I've grown up around kids my whole life. I've, you know, my father's in the restaurant business and being around kids is a, a number one thing. Uh, this is one of the most regulated businesses you will ever get yourself into. There is no cutting corners. You cut corners, you will not be in business. Uh, I've been very successful in this business and been in this business for almost, t uh, almost five years now. Uh, Bobby has been in for over five years. So one of our things is to educate the town and educate the schools and the kids on that you know, drugs are not good, right? These are, this is not a drug, this is 2020, this is the new medicine of our generation. Um, and we will definitely educate kids on the, the use of it um, and also the guidelines of it as well. Um, you know, they have DARE in, in school and they educate kids as well. We're willing to do that. Uh, we're, we're also gonna work with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, we're gonna work with the police departments, the fire departments. Um, and we're going to help give back to the community. I mean, I think this is an amazing opportunity for the town of Dudley. I think it's also an amazing opportunity for the town of Webster because it's on the, on the line of that as well. Um, so just to answer your question, I really do think that everybody is going to benefit from the opportunity that we're bringing here. And to be honest, I'm a resident from here. I'm more, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to try to bring something to a community that really plays a, a really big place in my heart, to be honest with you. Thank you. I just, uh, <clears throat> again, not to take up too much of your time. Um, is there a syllabus for those educational programs that can be passed out to the school, local businesses, and so forth? And uh, will you are re be readily available to hand this equipment out, uh, this literature out, I should say, this information, which is v so vitally important? You mentioned drugs and so on, the education for our youngsters. This is key, as far as I'm concerned. The challenges that these youngsters have out there today is paramount. It, take, it takes a community to get together, Absolutely. To make sure they get the right information so they're going to be safe, they're going to have a good future. That's where I'm coming from. And I appreciate that and I respect that. And uh, as long as the laws and the guidelines allow us to educate, we will 100% put a program in place that educates the youth in the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, 
Stephen Sullivan, Delhi Board of Selectmen, Cardinal Drive. My good friend who spoke previous, outstanding question. Um, one of my children is an educator in the school system, and I think anything that we come up with a host agreement through the board, through these gentlemen, would obviously uh, mitigate any impact on the children. A point I wanted to make, when these gentlemen came before us, uh, we kind of gave like a little spiel ourselves at the board, and people came to me after and said, you know, looks like you guys already made up your mind. There's been no endorsement. There's no quid pro quo. There's been no... I haven't spoke to any of these gentlemen about anything. So it's a, we're an open mind. Uh, there were some quotes in the paper by one of our other members. We all speak individually. None of us have got together on either side of the issue. So I want to keep an open mind. It's a great presentation. It's the future. It's... If it's regulated, if it's they got licensures and there's uh, safeguards in place, I trust these gentlemen, I trust the state, I trust our police chief. I just think we, we owe them the opportunity to give their presentation. But the big point is I want to just say there's been no endorsement by the Board of Selectmen. There's no quid pro quo. I don't believe anybody in the town hall has any kind of backdoor agreement. So I want everyone to keep an open mind and we'll come to a nice rational decision. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just add on that, um, we weren't seeking an endorsement until the next time we were before the selectmen. Um, we'd have to get their endorsement to a host agreement. And then ultimately, the planning board would also have to issue a special permit once our application is before the state. So the planning board would endure, have to sign off on it um, during that process. The police department, the highway department, the uh, fire chief, they would all be verily uh, integrated into that process. So ultimately, we'd have to seek their approval to make sure that those plans uh, meet the regulations um, and going back to the children issue um, you know you have to show your idea at numerous points um, at this stage when you get in when you purchase um, your computer system is hooked up to the state system um, so there, it's very regulated to make sure that there's no underage sales or use of this product um, you have connection to the state system itself so um, you know, if there's an issue of potential fake IDs or anything along those lines, um, you're kind of using the same system that the police department would be utilizing to make sure that those IDs are getting scanned and that information is popping up to make sure the individual in front of you is the person on that ID. Thank you. Next question. Member of our Board of Health, maybe? No? I just, I just want to bring something to... Uh, Yes, sir. Okay. Because I know there will be 10 questions on my door tomorrow morning, so <laughs> now's the chance to do it. Good evening. Uh, Ed Nibalo, represent uh, 30, 32, 34 Chase Ave, uh, direct the butters to the property. Um, I watched the selectmen's meeting back in the 26th. There was, I think there was a comment made that it's sort of off the beaten trail. Um, th this property directly faces residential dwellings and zoning may comply but the fact is there's there's residential do dwellings there I, I've spoken with attorney Adamopoulos um, individually and thank him for his time and presentation was great took a lot of things off the table but <clears throat> we have a couple of we, we've a couple of issues that are probably going to be tabled until the planning board process I would think and they're directly related to that physical property and with respect to the PowerPoint, the build-out process, for, first of all, um, <clears throat> is, is the planning board process involved in the in-build-out, out-build-out out surrounding area? You know, um, we, we have some input and, and some requests. Uh, for example, there's a street light. There's three street lights in a row. One, one of, I mean, there's three poles in a row. There's no street light. Small things like that that really impact that area, um, both from a traffic standpoint and so forth. I, you know, you can't compare this to Leicester. You can't compare this to Webster. Facility in Webster is 50 to 70,000 square feet. This is mm -hmm. going to be 100,000. Quite frankly, the philosophical issues of the, uh, of the retail establishment s sort of aside, our issues are more the uh, potential for distribution out of here and the traffic and the trucks going to the entire state. Right on the Connecticut border, you said it yourself. So we've got some issues relative to uh, again the the physical, um, the, the the physical area itself. You know, so so transportation-wise, um, any sort of delivery from 
the grow facility to any other facility um, occurs in pretty much small vans. You're not talking about 18 wheelers with this project whatsoever because you have to have cameras inside the vans. They have to be secured, GPS enabled. So there are specialized vehicles that the state signs off on to make sure that, and they're small. Like I said, they're, they're more so um, your flower van type of vehicle rather than any sort of truck. Look at it more like an Amazon Prime delivery vehicle along those lines. Um, the planning board during that special permit process would ultimately be involved um, with the whole build out inside. They'd also be um, enabled to look at anything that we're adding to the out exterior of that building. So we want to keep the historical integrity of that building in place. It was a big part that we discussed before we came in front of the selectmen. Um, we know that the town's very happy with these historical mills. Um, but there are certain things that they'd have to sign off on and be well aware of from cameras, which the state mandates, to there has to be specific lighting um, around the building. Um, so you know, the building itself would have lighting. If, if it comes up that there should be lighting on the street, then that's something that we would discuss with the town and work with. I've spoken briefly with the uh, police chief, and we mentioned it during uh, a presentation. You know, we're well aware of that, that curve is mm -hmm. you know, there. Um, whether it's putting in a sidewalk to make sure pedestrians are okay, whether it's you know working with the town for signage or Jersey barriers, um, ultimately we want to take your feedback as residents, um, especially the local abutters, and utilize that feedback to make sure that everyone's happy with the end product before this opens up. Um, you know, you and I discussed traffic flow from that big parking lot. Um, you know, like I said, there's, there's 20 spots in front of the retail. Um, most of, that, most of the traffic coming out of that big parking lot is going to be similar probably to the Ethan Allen traffic where you have, you know, blue collar and white collar workers leaving that parking lot rather than someone, you know, maybe leaving at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. But the police chief, the fire chief, highway department, planning board, selectmen, um, people that should come up to the planning board with feedback, they'd all be involved okay. during that yeah. special permit process. And, we, we, and we've been in touch over the pole and the lack of the street lights and couple other issues so so make sure there's gonna be a forum for that in the future yes. yeah okay thank you thank, thank you. you you're welcome yes ma'am my name is Lisa Brill I'm a resident I'm also a mom and I really liked what this gentleman said about our children and I'm all for guiding them in the right direction. And I think that this is very confusing for them to understand. I'm not for recreational use of marijuana. I'm against it. I understand the medicinal aspects of it. Um, my question, I think, to, is to the police chief, what does the town intend to do for the potential of increased crime that this may bring? So. Burglaries. If the. If the if it's Thank passed, you for your question, and, and that's more that's more appropriate for a public hearing. But if the chief would like to address it, I'm happy to let that go. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, ma'am. What did you say your name was? Lisa. Lisa. Nice to meet you, Lisa. Um, real quick, and this is a, a, a topic that I want to really touch on. Um, about two years ago, I got into the hemp industry. Today, it's federally legal. It comes from the same exact plant. Um, the only difference is the THC level is 0 0.3. <clears throat> In the past 10 years, I think opiates has been absolutely crazy in Massachusetts. Um, there have been thousands and thousands of deaths of opiates. Uh, one of the reasons why I got into the hemp industry <clears throat> um, I've had several friends that have went down the wrong road and wrong path in opiates. Uh, over the past seven months since that bill has passed, opiates have gone down 65% due to this plant, due to the medicine that this plant brings. So just to give a little education on that, I think that burglary, burglary and, and crimes and everything that you're worried about, it's not going to happen. This is one of the most regulated businesses that there possibly is. There's more crimes in other businesses and other companies than you will ever see in medical marijuana. Um, 
facts are facts. Look at how many burglaries and crimes have happened in Massachusetts in any type of recreational marijuana, zero. Um, so there is, uh, yeah, that, that was not that due to that, but um, I'm just trying to make a point that this is actually something that is going to bring something amazing to the town. Uh, you, we are gonna create a lot of jobs. We are going to redo a facility that needs to be redone and take it up to code. We are going to keep the mill exactly how it looks. We are gonna redo the inside of it. As much as this is a lucrative business and it will bring money to the town, it's also a very large investment into doing this operation. So I, I understand your concerns and we are more than happy to sit with you and talk with you and, and, and walk you through this. But uh, what we're trying to do today is not bring crimes or not bring anything bad to the town. We're really trying to bring positive to the town. Whether you see it or not, we really truly are. So anything or any questions that anybody has about their kids or anything, please, I will give you my personal number because that is something that means more than anything to me. So I hope that I kind of cleared that up, but any questions or anything, we're, we're here for you. And just to add on that, your, your end user is also um, a specific type of individual. There's, when you walk into one of these facilities, you're, you're spending a decent amount of money because not only are you paying the price for the product itself, there's, by the time you pay local, state, and the additional marijuana tax, it's an additional 20% tax on top of the product. So the individuals that I think these, most of these retail shops have seen go in there are your blue collar and white collar workers. Um, it's most likely not the individual kind of that's on the street looking for their local uh, local dealer. Um, I think that the part of the process the Cannabis Commission hoped by opening up these and making this legal in the state was that these individuals would have a mechanism of buying a product um, in a safe way, but it has, you know, it's it can be costly for the end user. So the people going into these facilities uh, are likely not the individuals looking for their local dealer on the road. In the security, there's more security cameras in a in a recreational facility like this than there is in a casino. So the the security is uh, unbelievable. Was there another question back here, Mr. Purcell? Yes, my name is Tom Purcell. I'm the agent for the Board of Health. Um, a couple of questions I have regarding it's purely financial now. Uh, what are your anticipated gross revenues for for the year? And the three percent that the the uh, towns, the cities and towns get uh, that have the tax in place. Is that based on the gross sales, or is that based on net sales or or what um. I, I don't think it'd be appropriate for me to, to guess on something like that because there's a big vertically integrated uh, uh, I guess algorithm that we would have to go through th th through those mechanics I, I'd be happy to do it. I need to think about that I don't know based on a hundred thousand square feet I can tell you that our facility in Washington does about 75 million a year um, and we are not vertically integrated and uh, so that is a big big difference in in how we compute numbers and what have you um, so in in Washington we have to have what's called a middleman we can't go seed to sale we're in, we're here we can be vertically integrated and, and create our own products and sell them through through the dispensary so that's a benefit for the town because you're going to be getting it in two different ways you'll be getting that excise tax and you'll be getting a usage tax which is the city tax so um, I think three is the bare minimum. Um, if you're looking tax. for a number, I want them to say several million dollars a year. And the tax is based on the sales itself, not yes, the... Yes, sir. So the, yeah. there's a 3%... 3% of all the gross sales. There's a local tax on the retail sales. Or the net, the net then, sales. No, no. no the, on the so every retail sale that would go through that 5,000 square foot establishment, town is going to get 3% on every product that gets sold there. And then... You have an anticipated the, volume that you expect to do? I mean... You have an anticipated volume of water you're going to be using, square footage, production per plant, and all of that. So you, have the, you must have a target. Well, I just want to just continue on your first question. The, and then the host agreement itself also has a, um, the Canvas Commission allows up to 3% of gross revenue to go back to the town. So really the town's benefiting on two different ways. The retail tax um, that was passed at town meeting, and then the state through the town uh, host agreement 
would have a yearly payout um, back to the town. So that's based on gross revenue. Okay. So we're still talking about that $75 million a year. Figure that. Gross several, sales. several million dollars. On to and then on top of all the other usage and excise taxes, we bring, you know, three to 400 new employees to the town as well. Real estate taxes. Yeah. All that still has to get paid by DMA Holdings also. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Is Laura? I'm a resident. Um, I didn't well, just know a little close of me. I'm sorry. Can't sorry. Remember. My name is Laura. I'm a resident, and I didn't know if having this type of business in the town has ever decreased home values in the area. Are you asking that as a, a, a question? Have you I, seen I, any um, any percentages of the homes by these businesses ever decline due to the the traffic in the oh. areas or? The homes being right across the no, street. No, no, not where our facilities are. Facilities, uh, I, I, I don't, I can't even answer that honestly. I don't think so. Um, it's, we've had no. It, I, I'm, that's a great question. I've never, it's never been asked before. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I will look into that, and I will, if I find some uh, literature on that and some facts on that, it, it'll be. I'll have it put it up on the website. Thank you. In the state of Massachusetts, these have only been open for what, two years now. I think the retail stores. So, I'm not sure there's been a yeah. full study done done yet but you know just so you know like once again the signage and everything concerning these facilities you're not going to look outside and see bright uh, marijuana leaves or anything like that none of that is allowed whatsoever you will see DMA Holdings um, LLC on the building and that's really the only sign that can be put on those buildings and no one wants a lot of attention being brought to these buildings because you know you are growing marijuana inside of it the facility that um, Bobby is a part of in Washington uh, has actually been there for about six years now um, when I went there about six months ago I got an uber driver that has grown up there his entire life knew the entire town and had absolutely no clue that the place that I was walking into was a medical marijuana cultivation of hundred and forty thousand square foot and he's been there his entire life. So they're a lot more discreet than a lot of people think. So they thought we were bottling Coca Cola there because it's six next to a Coca Cola plant. And they do it all the time. They're like, oh, yeah, you're going to the Coke plant. And I'm like, okay, we are <laughs> going to the Coke plant. <coughs> yes, ma'am. I am Kristen Jabowski. I am a medical marijuana patient who lives in Dudley. I would like to know, having uh, been through the process of getting a prescription and going to the dispensary and showing my ID as soon as I pull into the security guard, showing my ID to the second person who opens the door for me, showing my ID to the third person uh, who fills out my paperwork, and showing my ID to the fourth person who fills my prescription. <laughs> we'll work on a VIP line for you. <laughs> it's, what do I stand to lose by any of this becoming less regulated? What, what is the harm to me if this goes underground and I do not have the access um, that is clearly uh, well thought out. Uh, what what will I lose if if I don't have access to I'd this to type that. of regulation? I'll, I'll, I'll let Bobby answer that. But real quick, you'd be giving more tax money to another town, and this town deserves it. So. And there is a chance, you know, that if I can't get my medication from a dispensary. You know, I, I don't want to get, you know, the vape cartridges that have vitamin E. Exactly. As, you know, I, d I don't want to risk. You want a regulated place to go to to know that you can I am, I am go happy to town. I am happy to pay the taxes. I am um, happy I, to show my I, ID. Then, then I'll speak a little bit on this. Then, um, then, then you're speaking to the right person. Um, I am probably a little bit biased on our brand. Um, we grow arguably, if not arguably, the, the best marijuana in the United States. We are under the highest regulations of any state in the union. 
I will put our regulations uh, against any state, including California, which we also operate in. Washington, we have basically and effectively wrote the laws and the governing laws of how marijuana is regulated and tested. They've been in our building every single month for five years. We do absolutely zero, zero byproducts in our vapes and in any of our stuff. We are fully organic inside and out. There's nothing in the property that you couldn't eat that would kill you. Uh, there's nothing in our marijuana that is anything but natural. We, we're at the highest level. We win awards every single year. I can go on for hours and hours. And then all I can say is if we are fortunate enough to get this, uh, um, this product and this, uh, uh, this business in Dudley, I'll personally give you a, a tour of the facility. I, I just, you know, I, I don't want to be one of those. Uh, this is a comment, not a question. But uh, I, you know, also have children in my life that I care about. And I would much, much rather that they had access to something that was regulated and something that is tested and something that is taxed and people are responsible for. Your, 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 your Massachusetts has, has benefited from the regulations and laws that have come from our business in Washington. We were the first to do it 15 years ago. Um, so Massachusetts, all your CCs, your CCs are all regulated from California, Washington, Colorado. I, I remember voting in, uh, I think it was 2013, um, uh, but to legalize medical marijuana in Mass. Um, but I have only noticed positive changes. Um, and I think that in terms of you know, children or anyone who needs medication, I think that the more places we have will only be good for the towns there, I, there i've there's no increase in no crime and, and we're know, 21 and over i and i've driven past the dispensary in, in oxford you know five different times and it's right on main street i go there all the time but it's it's so unnoticeable even i you know still don't always recognize it because it's meant to be indiscreet and everyone is kind and yeah. polite and I, and I really d think that it would benefit a lot of people um, and it would prevent a lot of kids from going to ask people who maybe don't know what they're talking about and don't have access to anything. <coughs> Well, legalization has brought it, it. I know there's a big stereotype. There is everything. Well, there's always stereotypes when things are uh, are new, and uh, and what have you. And and, I'm, and we have our hurdles, and we're, we're gonna we're gonna climb one one at a time. But I, 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 we're I, bringing I, it out of the shadows. Uh, we bring it into the light. Bring it out of the shadows, like you yes. said. The CC. Yes. Is, we, we're governed. We're, their fingers on our pulse. Let's regulate it. Make it safe. Like people, kids are kids are gonna want drugs. Like that's. <laughs> That's how life works, and I and I really think it's important that there are people um, who are willing to to say, "Listen, we want to make this as safe as we can." <coughs> it's you know, it's not going to go away. This is this is how we can make it better. And the and state regulations make sure that is what happens because they follow it from seed to sale. So that seed is put into a system. That plant is tagged. When it's manufactured, it's tagged. And when it's ultimately sold, it's tagged. So there is a following that seed all the way till it gets put into a product and, and sold. I, the state knows where it is and I where can, it's going. I can follow. I can log in, and I can actually see every purchase I've ever gotten um, since I got my medical marijuana card. So I can not only follow you know, my own um, medication, but like I can keep track of you know, what I have access to. And, and just knowing that someone is looking out for me, that I'm not just buying random drugs. <laughs> it, 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 feels, it feels like going into a pharmacy. It, it's, it's the same as going into CVS when I pick up my other meds. Um, and I, I really think it should be normalized um, and encouraged. Like, people that are worried about their kids, like, your kids are going to get into stuff. That's what kids do. Um, so let's let's teach them, and let's show them what responsible use looks yeah. like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, sir. Hi, Ron. Ned Bala. Uh, I own the properties across from you. Um, everything you sell, is that going to be manufactured here, or will we come in from someplace else? No. no, everything has to be manufactured in this state, sir. In this state? So the, the, the goal of this project is to first, if licenses are obtained, the retail establishment would be built out open first so that it could be a cash generation while the build out of the rest of the facility is done. So if you're asking if all the products can be manufactured in Dudley to start off with? Yes. To start off with, it would not be, but we discussed with the selectmen at the last meeting, by the time that the manufacturing grow is up and oper operational, um, that retail would be uh, stocked with product from Dudley. What's the time period on that, do you know? It's a nine to 12 month process. 12 yeah, months. the build out is very tedious. And so it's when you first open, it's gonna be from someplace else, not from? It, it will be from the state of Massachusetts, right. but it will definitely be from another facility because our facility won't be able to supply it for at least a good six to 12 months. Okay, thank you. And, and just to go back to the, the previous uh, uh, woman's statements, um, the state is even you know, very cognizant of the product after it's even manufactured. Um, they make sure that the listing of the ingredients in the THC levels and everything along those lines matches the actual product and they'll do random testing um, and a company in Massachusetts uh, within the last couple of months actually got fined a very substantial amount because the level, I believe the level of THC in your product was not what was listed on the product itself. So even once a product is completed and put up for sale, um, the regulations in the state are still making sure that that product is what it actually says it is. Another question? Uh, this was probably for Bob, is it? Bobby, yeah. Bobby. <coughs> On the, um, read about some of these having smell. You talked a little bit about the um, chlorine dioxide and the carbon scrubbers and so forth. Can you talk about, in your experience, a size of this facility, right? and again, Webster's a little smaller, right? I mean, this isn't just a shop. What, what's, I mean, there's a lot of butters there in Webster also right up there. I mean, there's a lot of potential for smoke. Can you talk a little bit more about that, a little bit more detail, what you've experienced, what may have come out in the last three years for technology maybe, just so if anybody asks any question of us, we got a good question. It, um, th like you said, that we've used we use the carbon scrubbers. Um, what what sets us apart from from most grows? We uh, eat, all of our grows are in what, uh, what we do, we encapsulate them in 1,100 square feet. So basically, it's like a Lego system in there. So we have this full co we have full full rate. We're fully we compartmentalize everything we grow so we can control everything we can grow for the previous questions and what have you. So we carbon we carbon scrub each room. <coughs> Um, and it, those ionizers, they do a great job on, I mean, is it going to get 100%? No. Does it get a, in the 90s? Yes. And it, it depends on uh, like where in the stroke of the, of the plant. Is it, you know, when the, we, we go our plants, it takes 62 days to harvest to the day. So from 50, from 40 to into the 60s, it starts creating a little more smell. So those, those rooms are we do the best we can on that carbon ionization and it, it, it's it, it's really really works fantastic like you can't walk up to our you can't maybe if you walked up to the front door of our facilities said the one in Washington you may smell something but you're if you drove down the street and had the car the window open you're not smelling anything even walking outside of the building you won't smell anything as well there's this is not manufacturing where it's coming out of a smokestack or like other you know big companies use um, it, everything is within the building and it stays within the building. Understood, but by size, it's, a, it's, it's pretty big comparative to other facilities. So 100,000 100, square feet. So Webster's right? currently 54. That's 100, right? It's going to be 100. Yeah. Um, and your butt's price chopper. Yeah. So. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so that's a good butter to at least make sure they're probably uh, very okay. conscious Thank you. about the smell. Thank you. Rob. We're right about at the one hour mark of their. A few more, and then we'll, Mr. Marcy. <coughs> Sorry, it's my thing. John Marcy, Board Dudley Board of Selectmen, uh, Three Fairview Avenue. Um, just a general question. You know, yeah, I, I've fielded lots of questions from residents. Smell. Thank you for covering that. Thanks for asking that. Um, 
What's the number one th reason a, co a community says yes to a project like this? And second, what's the number one reason a community like this says no for a project? The, the, fir the first, uh, qu the, the answer to the first one, obviously, it's, 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 it's always a financial uh, decision. Um, I think that you, you look at uh, from the tax revenue, which I actually think pales in comparison to the effect on uh, we bring on, on the local businesses as it pertains to the job creation. Um, if you look at that matrix and how that matrix goes from top to bottom and you were to break it in, say, 300 employees, you're talking tens of millions of dollars a year in revenue generation to the community. And I'm talking, that's from community from whether it be a single household, two head household with a kid, um, and the usage that that creates, whether it be the movies, whether it be shopping, food, gas, any of those things. Um, I guess the, the main thing always derives, it, it comes down to money, tax revenue, and what have you. So I would leave that, that's my short and simple answer. Um, I can talk to you about the EIRs uh, as much as you'd like to, and I would be glad to do that. Um, as far as the negative, I think there any of the negatives that come that we've seen um, is probably because of the, the unknowns of what this industry has, because it has operated in the dark for so long, and I think now that we are in with a prohibition type generation of the genesis of this deal, so I think it would be that because of the misunderstandings and the people not educating themselves on what's really happening because we have been operating in the black market for so long, not us personally. We never have, never will. Um, so I think that it's our job to educate and be open to the community to, to help with that because I really think that, that is, that's what sets us apart and I think that's really the one that's always the cog in the wheel is that and if we do a good job educating and understanding what really is we are doing and what, what, where this advancement is going and when, what this marketplace is doing, because it's not slowing down, it's speeding up. I think that would be a, be a good start. Mr. Siganovich. Uh, Kerry Siganovich, Airport Road. I'm also a member of the Board of Selectmen. This isn't a question for you folks. This is actually uh, something for the residents. We have a Selectmen's meeting every other week. Our next one is this coming Monday. We have a section our, on our agenda called Citizens' Comments, where anyone who is a resident in town, if you have question, comment, whatever, you can come forward if it's not on the agenda and ask us it. We want to hear from you. We don't want anyone here to feel like they weren't heard in this process. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Weiner. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, if, let's see, I've been, I've been on the job here now a little over 31 years, and if you ever thought I'd be standing up talking about pot one day, uh, <laughs> it, that's, it is one thing about my job that I always looked at, and I said every day is a little something different. Well, this is another one of those times where it's a little something different. Um, certainly, this was, a, this was an issue that was, uh, I, was, I was against, and uh, I have my own personal feelings on it uh, with that. Um, but the, uh, the thing I learned long ago in this, in my field, is whether I agree with something or I disagree with something, whatever the law is, the law is. And uh, you have to operate within the boundaries of that law, and you have to stay within those particular regulations. So this is certainly not a perfect industry or a perfect setup by any means. <clears throat> I think uh, it's the combination of something now is it can be easily manufactured in your home or uh, in your garden. Uh, something can be very easily done on its own versus now making it a regulated industry. So <clears throat> at least I think in this case, uh, my focus is to work with anybody in this field, and these gentlemen have been uh, very receptive to things, uh, to make sure things are done properly, safely, and as regulated as possible. Uh, my, my obligation is the care and protection of the people of the community. That's, that's my job. So I'm looking out for that best interest of everything. Uh, I have had kids go through the school system, work very closely in the schools, do a lot of the different pro programs and projects up there. So that is the number one priority, to make sure that uh, the things are done properly there. 
uh, in shifting the focus, and I, I hope to work with uh, these folks or anybody else with that, is the biggest concentration is the black market operation. It's still operating and still will be done. Uh, there's still some stigma out there as far as people can just go do whatever they want, and that's, that's where that's got to change. If this is going to be a regulated industry where you're going to have products that are going to be uh, tested and properly done, uh, that's one way to move. But now any Tom, Dick, or Schmo can bring it in from any place and just sell it and, and do whatever they want and try to undercut people, that's where the problem comes in. I think we're seeing a lot of those, in, those issues with the, the vape products and different things that are going on. Uh, one of the things we also looked at too with this uh, with this type of thing is, uh, and it was always a concern to me, and that's why I see the board of health people. It's always it's always interesting of how we had all the anti-smoking regulations and things, um, but when you involve things like uh, lollipops and gummy bears and sodas and everything else like that, you know you start looking at it in a little bit different light. So I think the state has taken some met methods at least to try to make those products not so appealing to kids. Uh, obviously, it's still there. And it's something we have to deal with. And as parents, that's, uh, it's the unfortunate reality of what we have to deal with now. It's just a new thing that's out there. Uh, but uh, the biggest thing is I want to make sure we stay on top of this. And uh, I've had several conversations uh, with the attorney on this. And it, it will continue going forward. That is the one thing that we're focused on there. Certainly, if there's any issues in that area, if things uh, change or there's problems, we'll be focused on traffic. Uh, Foot traffic, it was one thing we looked at where you, you're going to have to, there are residences in the area, but it's not a heavily populated Main Street downtown area where a lot of people would just be kind of roaming around and moving through. So you're probably going to be going over there with a purpose. Uh, the thing we, we had discussed too about starting out was to start out by appointment only. So that as you run a period of time by appointment only, to kind of gather what's the, what's the trend in the business that's going to take place over there. So that you can kind of monitor that again too and know what you're going to expect. But uh, that's just my thing. I'm, we're going to stay on as best we can. We had spoken about uh, getting drug recognition experts. One of the problems that we have now is with uh, the operating under the influence of not only marijuana, but uh, opiates. And uh, we're seeing the increase in, in drug driving. Uh, and uh, our illustrious courts have thrown out some of the regular sobriety tests for alcohol that can't be used for drugs. So every officer that's trained for alcohol tests really can't use those to test for drugs. So uh, the trend is to get people trained as drug recognition experts. And so I had the uh, conversation with them about getting at least two or possibly more likely three of my officers certified in that to help us combat that issue about people driving on the roads. So those are just some of the things that I had. If, if anybody has any questions for me specifically, I'd be glad to help out. But, uh. My name is Joanne, and I live right across into the state of Connecticut. But my question is adult use, adult use, adult use. I have no idea what an adult is anymore. Can you tell me what that age 21. is? 21. 21. Yeah, the purpose, I think, when this all went through, um, and it's still, again, the industry is trying to work itself out, but they wanted to regulate it more like alcohol. And uh, so the, the Cannabis Control Commission kind of regulates a lot of that thing, of how that goes. That's why people mention about the fact of showing IDs and everything else going in. Uh, multiple checks with those uh, for those things as you go through. So 21 is the limit on that. But thank you very much. As this process goes forward, again, if anybody has any questions, you want to get in touch with me, you know where I am. But uh, I guess another change and another little interesting twist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. And uh, as the process does go forward, um, you can rest assured that the everything will be very well publicized, the meetings, the planning one meetings, Board of Health, Board of Select meetings, everything will be advertised. So I, we encourage to have a kind of robust attendance that we had here tonight. Uh, Jen Kunoya, with the last question. Thanks. Hi, Jen Kunoya, <clears throat> West Dudley Road resident and also Board of Health. You mentioned a lot of other boards tonight and we just want to be sure that you do stop over and see the Board of Health. We did spend many months on our regulations which mirror the cannabis control and we do look forward to just working with you and we appreciate that. So just stop by and see us during this whole process. No, for sure, Th through the CUP process, um, we, we, we hit every, I mean, we hit right. every door from obviously the law enforcement, fire to, to the health, to uh, traffic. To, uh, we, our CUP process is very, very, um, I'll say, um, 
we, we cover all, all, all of our bases. Great. So everyone's involved so we don't, we don't run into, we want all the heads to be talking to each other so we don't run into issues that we have with the, with the building codes and safety, all that stuff. We 100% we will be involved uh, in, in all aspects of the city and through our CUP process. We have a few pr pretty good little checks and balances on our, on our systems. Okay. I have one last question. You mentioned retail, retail, retail. Can you just explain what you're going to be selling at retail? And I know Cannabis Control has specific regulations that everything has to be labeled and things like that. But if you we'll could just give us a general we'll overview. So anything that the state allows us to sell within those confines, um, and, and indeed, yes, everything is um, uh, uh, skewed and in a way we call our portal. We have everything in a portal so we know exactly uh, the, the genesis of the product to the, to the that we call it seed to sale. Mm -hmm. From when it is a seedling to sell, everything is on, on our packages that are, it'll tell you exactly the strain, the right. type, the effects of, the amount of THC in them, um, and then where, where they were tested. Okay. They're skewed. E everything is skewed. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Last call. No pun intended. Seven o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> we're way over then. Uh, well, all right, so on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, I'd like to thank all the residents for attending tonight. I especially want to thank the uh, town officials that made an effort to come here tonight and get some questions answered because now is a great opportunity to do it. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who was watching at home, which I'm sure there was probably a lot more people watching at home than actually came here tonight, so I hope this is very informative. Thank you. With that said. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Fred. Good enough. Thank you.